God exists, God must do things. For God to be God, God could not do nothing. And because I yearn to know whether God is real or just to know whether God makes sense, I need to inquire what things would God do? Assuming there is a God who created the universe, then God should do things with the universe, relate to the universe. So I have two questions, and they test the internal consistency of God as a hypothesis. Assuming God exists, does the universe, apart from God, have independent existence? And how would God intervene in the universe? I'm Robert Lawrence Kuhn, and Closer to Truth is my journey to find out. How God relates to the universe affects directly the kind of God that is supposed to exist. And if I am serious about seeking God, then I must be serious about discerning God. So, how would God relate to the universe? I begin with a systematic theologian at the University of Copenhagen, an expert in science and religion, Niels Henrik Gregersen. Niels, most people who believe in God believe that God actively relates to the world by some means, whether intervention in our lives, fulfilling or listening to our prayers. How do you see God relating to the world? In a sense, I think that it is an all over or not at all game that we have to play here. Either you have to think of God as relating to each and any creature at each moment, that is, as caring, or you have to see God as simply just the first course in a long process, which is just then maintained. That is, that would be a more external view of relation. But I do think that the most interesting part of God's ways of relating to the world as I see it is the possibility that there will be a two-way relationship between the world. God is, in a sense, relating to the world in order to let the world relate to God. And how can this take place? Well, in many very simple pictures. One is the picture of light. God cannot be the light without actually enlightening the world. And from the Hebrew language, the word for blessing, barak, God is blessing the world. But human beings thanking God is also described as a barak. So God is blessing in order for humans to thank. So we are part of a divine human circulation. So this blessing that God does, is it one enormous blessing that God sends out and we all bask in it? Or is it individually related where God is focused on innumerable numbers of people and animals and who knows what else? For me, in a sense, it must be general in scope. But it's like a morning. Every morning is a blessing, but it is not the same morning. But this is, in a sense, what religion is about. It's a learning to appreciate the different blessings of life. But they are not individually tailor-made blessings because it is an ongoing business, but it is not the same business. From moment to moment, it is different. That puts more responsibility on us as individuals to relate to God as God relates to yes. the world. Yes, I think it does. In earlier times, also in my own tradition, which is, is the Lutheran tradition, we said God gives unreservedly. Our own task is to receive. And that is true. But in a sense, by receiving properly, we are also giving God recognition. So the very idea that we have to give something to God is something which has become foreign to our religious ways of thinking of God. Because many would say, well, God is in need of nothing, but we humans, we are in need of everything. But maybe we are living in this sort of community, but we are there as partners and not just as lazy, passive recipients. 
The God that you see, is that a God who sees the flow of history as something that that God uh, is involved in either shaping or intervening in any way whatsoever? Or is that God just watching it and not knowing where it's going to go? I don't think that God is just watching and I don't think that God is intervening because I do think that God is already part of the process. There is no worldly reality in which God is not already present in, in a saturated way that fills through everything. So I think that God understands things from within and without so that we don't need a God who is sitting up there watching us passively, nor do we need a God who is just doing all the job for us and just simply forcing us to do this or that. If God's relationship with human beings is two-way, each giving and receiving, as Neil says, then God seems especially personal and imminent, connected intimately with the universe. That would be comforting, I suppose, but I'd need to take the next step. How could God do it? How could God connect intimately with the universe? I asked the professor of systematic theology at Martin Luther University in Germany, Dirk Evers. First, I would say God is the ground of all being. God is the one who is responsible for that. There is something rather than nothing. He is responsible for the cosmos as process which explores opportunities and possibilities. Then he is also referring to the creatures that arise in this process. God is not the king of the world of reality, but he lets reality develop its own identity, its own path of existence. And then he relates to what uh, arises within creation. So first we have this uh, classical cr creation uh, activity of God that he is responsible for that there is something in space and time and the basic fundamental laws. And then we have his relation to living beings. Then we have his relation to the history of humankind. You first started, and I find this interesting, by talking about God's responsibility, mm -hmm. whereas most theologians would begin by talking about God as the creator. D do you make that as a, a specific distinction by, by emphasizing responsibility more than creation? If you compare that to the deistic view, then you would say God is the creator, he makes the world, and then the world moves on, and then maybe he interferes by miracles or something. But uh, when he is responsible for it, from the very beginning, he is in a relationship to creation that necessarily involves these different ways of relating to reality, not only guaranteeing space, matter, time, uh, and the fundamental laws of reality, but also in a very subtle way, interfering with uh, life, with the striving of living beings, with the search of human beings uh, for meaning and uh, a fulfilled existence, and so on. Is this an active process on the part of God, this interfering, or is it just setting the system that the system itself has an interfering process? I think it is both. Uh, it is, uh, on the one hand, just uh, setting and adjusting the system so that it moves and strives towards new levels of meaningful existence. But on the, on the other hand, it's also an active involvement, and that uh, is where the, the, the core of Christian theology comes in. Some theologians today would say that when you have God intervening in the world in different ways, God is like a tinkerer. Uh, coming in and doing little things here and there and, and really shows the impoverishment of the original creation. And more powerful would be a God who set the system in motion so that it could be uh, self-generating. Well, that's a classical argument. Uh, Gottfried Leibniz, for example, said that in opposition to Isaac Newton, when Isaac Newton said the planets ev revolve around the sun mm -hmm. until the system needs a reformation, as yeah. Newton writes, and Leibniz said that's ridiculous. A perfect creator would have created a world that ne is not in need of interference uh, from the creator to correct or adjust anything that happens in the world. You disagree with that? I disagree with that. 
I wouldn't stick to the uh, position of Newton uh, and say so there are irregularities that, that have to be readjusted, but I would say this relation between God and creation is contingent. It's not just a program. It's not a perfect world that just goes on and you couldn't give an argument why there would be re reality at all. Because if reality would be perfect, why then should it take the burden to be reality? Then God would think about perfect reality and that's the mm -hmm. end of it. Creation has to be a risky thing. And only then it makes sense. It's also risky for God. I mean, our lives aren't, aren't perfect. Our reality isn't perfect. God relates to reality in order to inspire beauty, in order to inspire goodness. And not just, uh, he, he, he has programmed it into creation, but he's trying to inspire it and to have us as contributors uh, to it. And that makes uh, creation a risky thing. And that is an opposition to this idea of a perfect plan of creation. To Dirk, creation is risky and reality is not perfect. In fact, if reality were perfect, God would have no need to create it. God could have just thought about it. This means that if a creator God exists, the universe would have to be a complex and uncertain place. I like the insight. Though it seems to deny traditional theologies of God's absolute providential control. But is the argument a rationalization? Believers do not see God's actions and purposes as clearly as they'd like, and they need to explain why. Or worse, is it circular reasoning? Because believers start by assuming God exists, yet they do not see clearly God working, so they further assume that God created an imperfect world in order to support their original assumption that God exists. Two questions then follow. Why is God hidden? How is God involved in this imperfect world? I ask a believer, an expert in the debate between science and religion, Chris Southgate. Chris, how do we begin to address this question of our world that seems to go on just fine with a, a God that uh, at best is, is hidden? Well, because God is God and not a creature, there's a sense in which God will always be to a large extent hidden from our understanding. As far as God's relating to the world, we understand that in terms of God as creator, uh, the one who gave rise to the laws and processes which resulted in this world, and God as redeemer, the one who will ultimately bring healing and reconciliation and peace to the whole cosmos. Within that, there's a sort of uh, further question about how God from day to day is relating to particular individuals and situations. It's the, the problem of providence, if you like. So let's unpack all of this. The first, you have God as creator. Now, there are two ways of understanding creator. One is literally to create from nothing. And the second is to have an active role in the continuous maintenance of whatever is causing the world in a sustaining nature. So that's, you know, creator part A and creator part B, if, if that's not too profane. No, well, yes to both of those. <laughs> yeah. There's nothing uh, in this or any other universe which doesn't owe its existence to God. And it also means that's a continual state of affairs that without God's love and power, nothing would continue to exist either. So when God created in the first place, it, it, the creation was not good enough to stand on its own. It could only stand on its own if it were God, because it's not God but a creature. It needs God's love and power to sustain it. So God is unable to create something that has the capacity to sustain itself after God creates it. God cannot do that. God can't create God, though in the Christian understanding, the Son is begotten of the Father in the Spirit. But any created thing will be dependent on its creator. 
And then you have God as Redeemer, which is a, spe a specific theology that will change the world in some broad way. But what does this all imply about God's involvement uh, in what happens in the world? There are many theories as to exactly how God is providentially involved in the world. The great difficulty is to marry up the very involved God that we learn about in the scriptures with the sheer extent of suffering and pain in the world as we know it. And the more you talk about God's involvement, the more intense the problem of suffering and evil. Chris exposes the logical tensions of the Christian worldview. The more God is involved in the world, the bigger the problem of evil. All monotheistic religions must deal with God's relationship with the world and the logical tensions that result, each with its own style. To get a traditional Jewish approach, I visit Rabbi David Schatz, professor of philosophy, ethics, and religious thought at Yeshiva University. Uh, I gotta start with a story. This fellow's looking around, driving for a parking space, and he's going crazy. And finally he says, oh God, please grant me a parking space. Two seconds later, a guy pulls out and he says, oh, never mind, I found one. <laughs> it shows this sort of tension that people have between, on the one hand, believing that God does things for them, and on the other hand, saying, no, no, it really happens by, by natural causes. We have a range of views. Let me just sort of set up two extremes and then maybe something in the middle. One extreme is a view that's called occasionalism. Uh, what occasionalism says is that nothing outside of God has any causal powers. For example, I want to raise my hand. Well, what happens is I have this desire to raise my hand, and then my hand goes up. Now, what happens there is that my thought is the occasion, that's what's called occasionalism, for God to raise my arm. I didn't really raise my arm. And if I throw a rock against the window and the window breaks, what has really happened is that on the occasion of the rock hitting the window, then God has brought about the window breaking. Objects have no causal powers. Why are people occasionless? Well, partly because the view is that to believe that something outside of God has causal powers is essentially a pagan view. Huh? And in that sense, it's coming from a very, very powerful religious sensibility. Nothing can do anything except for God. I've always found this view, though, problematic. First of all, there's the issue of free will. I mean, it seems to take away people's free will. On the other hand, the thinkers who adopt it want to make room for free will. And an obvious tension. They have an uphill battle in, in Well, it sounds that. like what they want to do is, is yeah. amplify God's importance amplify and Amplify God's importance, right. Uh, what we call laws of nature is simply the usual patterns that God adopts in the world. But God can make exceptions to the usual pattern. He's really doing everything. The other extreme is an extreme I guess we can call naturalism, which many people believe is something Maimonides adopted. The position is that God sets up a system of laws at the beginning. The laws are amazing in the following respect. The world is set up in such a way that it's kind of user-friendly, meaning things tend toward a purpose, and the properties of objects are such and human capabilities are such, human mental capabilities are such, that if people understand nature and how it works, they can protect themselves and live fruitful and enriching lives. So the world is teleological. It leads towards a purpose, but people act within this world. Not quite deism. It's not that God sets up any old world. He sets up a world that's teleological. That's the other extreme. Why adopt that extreme? Why keep God out of the picture? Well, the primary reason is to emphasize God's wisdom. See, occasionalism emphasizes power. Right. Naturalism emphasizes his wisdom. To give an example, um, suppose that I have somebody give me a computer program and I keep having problems with it. And each time I call the guy, he comes and he's able to fix the problem, <laughs> fine. Then I get this other program from somebody else and it just works perfectly. 
Now, who's the better programmer, the one who can actually fix everything, or the one who designed everything in the first place so that it doesn't need fixing? And that's the most powerful intuition behind naturalism. Naturalism also helps a bit with the problem of evil, because if you see God as intervening frequently into the world, the question will come up, well, why does he save this person, doesn't save this person? It's also more it's consistent with the, with the scientific worldview that right. we have today. Exactly. It's consistent with the scientific worldview. But I think that most Jewish thinkers opt for something in the middle. In the middle is simply the idea that the world works essentially according to natural laws, but there are occasional miracles. This way, you eat your cake and have it too. You have the notion of God's wisdom. You also have the notion of God's saving power. Although culturally distinct, Jewish philosophy is similar to Christian and Islamic philosophy. Most thinkers opt for an intermediary position, where the world works mostly by natural laws which were created by God, but which God can still modify via supernatural intervention. Taking intermediary positions, avoiding extremes usually makes sense. But when working with God, I worry about balance and compromise. Because with God in the game, the rules change. The problem may not be that an idea is too radical, but that an idea is not radical enough. What about ideas of how God intervenes in the universe? How radical must such ideas be? I ask a philosopher of religion who specializes in God's traits, Edward Werenga. There's a way of understanding what the laws of nature are that allows there to be an, a divine or supernatural interference in the laws of nature. That theism, unlike deism, doesn't say that God just set up a world and left it run on its own, but that says that God sets up a world that he continues to be in, involved in. Not only did he make it, but he keeps it in existence. That's not enough to give us that he interferes with it. What he's doing is he's making things happen in regular ways, making things happen so that they accord with the customary application of the laws of nature. Well, then it's a short step from there to say what the laws of nature are like are not descriptions of how things always of necessity go, but they're descriptions of how things go unless God does something different. So if God is making things happen according to the regular operation of causal laws, and that describes how he regularly makes things go, allowing for exceptions, then he can interfere in the world by doing something out of the ordinary that is an interference in the world. The first premise you have is a very big leap because it says that the physical laws that you would believe God created are not such that they can continue without God having some continuous relationship with them. So that if God decided to just do nothing, right. it wouldn't just roll on its own, it would fall apart or disappear or something. Is that right? Right, the view, the continuous conservation is the view according to which if God stopped keeping stuff in existence, it would just pop out of existence. He didn't, he didn't make stuff that was indestructible or immutable. He made stuff that existed as long as he kept it in existence. If you take that first step, then I think it's much easier for God to interfere in the affairs of molecules or human right. societies because they are at every moment dependent upon God for their, their literal existence or fields or forces or movement in any way. But that first step is a very big one. Right. He could only interfere in the affairs of the world if he was constantly upholding the world otherwise. All right. So let's just say that it happens. What kind of a world is it? How often does God do that? Does God interfere in people's lives and does God heal people? I mean, you hear stories about people feel they were healed of this wart or that wart, but nobody gets a, an arm that grows back. Right. Uh, why is God busy with warts and not busy with regrowing arms? I think people have no idea how frequently God interferes in the affairs of the world, how frequently he does a miracle. Assuming God exists, does God intervene in the universe? The question depends on whether the universe has independent existence. And I see two possibilities. One, God could create the universe and still need to sustain it, such that if God stopped, the universe would disappear. This is classical theism. Two, God could create the universe to have independent existence, 
such that even if God disappeared, the universe would still go on. Regarding God's intervention, I have four possibilities. One, God does not intervene, allowing the universe to develop independently. This is classical deism. Two, God has determined all events so perfectly in God's initial creation, such that no intervention is necessary. Three, God intervenes in the physical world by affecting probabilities, such that no physical laws are apparently violated. Four, God intervenes in ways that seem to violate what we call physical laws, but true reality is far grander. My judgment, each possibility has its own kind of internal consistency. But I do not even know whether God exists, much less how God would intervene in the universe. But when I lay out the possibilities, I feel closer to truth. For complete interviews and for further information, please visit closertotruth.com.